the distinct honor of introducing our guests today. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Kelly Perrin. I'm the Assistant Director at the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism, in case you don't know who I am. Our distinguished guest today is Lyle Denniston. He's an American legal journalist, professor, and author who has reported on the Supreme Court of the United States for 51 years. 51 years? Sorry. 56 years. Oh, we may have to do other 56 years? Yes. Oh, that yes. is outstanding. I started when I was nine. Excellent. <laughs> he currently writes for uh, SCOTUS blog, an online blog featuring news and analysis of the Supreme Court, though in past he's written for the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, the Baltimore Sun, the American Lawyer, and the Washington Star. His commentary is also featured on a national public radio um, show here and now. In addition, he has contributed to numerous books and journals and is the author of The Reporter and the Law, Techniques for Covering the Courts. He has also taught classes on law, journalism, American constitutional history at American University, Georgetown, Penn State, and John Hopkins. So will you be calling on them as a professor? Oh, yes. Yes, like so be ready. Um, also, because of his longstanding coverage in the court, he has been referred to as the Dean Emeritus of the Supreme Court. Uh, Supreme Court Press Corps, and he enjoys the singular distinction of being the only person to earn a plaque in the Supreme Court press room. Such, we couldn't confirm that. Is that true? That's true. That's wow. True. Um, he is a native of Nebraska City, Nebraska, and a graduate of the University of Nebraska at Lincoln in Georgetown University, where he has a master's degree in political science and history. The title of his talk is 9-11 uh, plus 10, Entering the Age of Permanent War. Uh, should be a both interesting and maybe provocative talk. I can't wait to hear it. So please welcome uh, Mr. Denniston. Um, as I told a group with whom I met just a little bit ago, I had um, eye surgery earlier this month, and the doctors still haven't got me a pair of glasses that works. So this is going to be partly a lecture and partly a stumbling fumbling effort to find the right page in my notes. Um, but uh, for 1495, I can tell you that my glasses do, my vision has improved a little bit. Um, though if I look over your glasses, it's not because I've suddenly become very nerdy or more nerdy. It's because I would like to see you. And with these, for 1495, one does not get a lot of, of uh, industrial sophistication. But it works a little bit, so let me have a go at it. First of all, let me tell you an anecdote um, which I shared with the, uh, with the other group about my time at the Supreme Court. Uh, Professor Perrin mentioned that I had been with the Boston Globe. Um, <clears throat> I was covering the Boston Globe after I had retired um, from covering the court um, with um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Baltimore Sun. Um, by the way, I've had three retirement parties at the court, and none of them has taken yet. So. Uh, I continue to go on. The reason I'm the Dean Emeritus is because when I first retired, um, Nina Totenberg of NPR insisted that she was the next longest serving reporter, and so she was entitled to the title of Dean, um, and so uh, I had to move up to Emeritus. Um, and I, I guess it makes a little bit of difference because uh, once a year the reporters at the court have lunch with the Chief Justice, and the dean uh, gets to sit on the justices, the chief justice's right, and the dean emeritus has now moved to the chief justice's left. Though I must tell you, and this is a revelation that one perhaps ought not to make, my own ideology does put me to the left of this chief justice. Um, and I suspect that you're going to find uh, uh, some revelation of that inclination as, uh, as my talk proceeds. But um, in 2004, um, when the... Uh, the Hamdi and the Padilla cases came to the Supreme Court, both of which I'm sure are familiar to, to students of, uh, of um, the war on terrorism. Um, I was covering the court for the Boston Globe, but I was only uh, a freelancer for them. Um, and um, the Hamdi case was coming along, and I said um, to the bureau chief of the Globe, well, I certainly want to cover that for the Globe. And uh, he said, well, we have uh, a reporter on the staff who's... Uh, covering uh, terrorism issues, so he's going to cover it. Um, and I said, well, it, it's been my habit throughout my years as a reporter that if I'm the Supreme Court reporter, I cover the Supreme Court and not otherwise. And he said, well, you're the reporter. I'm the bureau chief. Um, 
you're not going to cover it. And so I resigned from that job and uh, fairly quickly thereafter took up my uh, present position with SCOTUS blog. Um, if you are not familiar with SCOTUS blog, um, it's, um, it's probably the most uh, reliable and comprehensive source about the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, the blog ca carries um, links to all of the legal filings in the Supreme Court in every case that is granted um, and uh, provides full access to all of the transcripts of oral arguments of the court and does very heavy, really in-depth analyses of all of the Supreme Court cases that are going to be decided in any given term. Um, so we, um, we've been at it, uh, the blog has been at it since 2001 um, and uh, has been uh, described um, uh, variously um, uh, as uh, the best legal blog there is, um, which is a, an appellation that we recently got from, uh, from Google. Um, and uh, Rachel Maddow um, on her show on MSNBC referred to our blog as a treasure uh, for what it covers about the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, I've been with the blog now since 2004 um, and uh, enjoy it enough that, um, uh, that I will stay with it for a while. My uh, wife insists that I work all the time, um, which is pretty close to true. Um, I, and one of the nice things about being a blogger is that I have no editor, um, I have no assignments, and I have no deadlines, um, which means that yesterday evening, um, after I got into my hotel, um, I had to go online and write about um, an opinion that Judge Ware had uh, issued in the Proposition 8 case in California. And then this morning at 6 o'clock, I got up and did a post uh, about uh, today's uh, uh, anniversary, or today is really major development. Today is the day in which Don't Ask, Don't Tell ceases to begin, uh, ceases to uh, be in effect as a military policy. Um, I must say it's a, uh, it's, it's a day of um, considerable rejoicing in the gay community um, and for others who uh, value human freedom. Um, it's, uh, the military has done, I think, a really spectacular job of preparing the troops uh, for this transition. Um, they took um, uh, almost a year to do so, uh, but they were very thorough about it. Um, and um, today is the day in which uh, you can now be gay and serve your country uh, uh, without apology, um, as, as indeed as never before. Um, but my task today <clears throat> is to talk to you about what I perceive as the present state of the rule of law uh, 10 years after the terrorist attacks um, on, uh, on New York, uh, Penn, Washington, and in Shanksville uh, in 2001. Um, let me start with um, a comment that was made in uh, what's called the Joint Operations Environment. And Colonel, you will uh, know what that is. Um, it's a, a periodic report uh, that the Joint Command puts out um, to analyze the nature uh, and the future of war. Um, and uh, it, it's, done, it's not done every year, and the most recent uh, version was published in 2010. Uh, the report has this really rather uh, uh, sobering conclusion. No one should harbor the illusion that the developed world can win this conflict with radical ideologies in the near future. The world, it added, had entered a period of persistent conflict. And of course, it is now true that that ideological conflict often tames, takes the form of armed hostilities. So the joint operation environment assessment seems to me not, whole lot, not wholly different from the chilling comment that George Orwell made in 1984, war is not meant to be won, it is meant to be continuous. There is, of course, real peril for all of us in that kind of a situation, one which we might now call the new normal. The world does seem, at least to me and obviously to many others, 
a decade after the 9-11 attacks, to be a much more dangerous place. No one can know where or when another terrorist attack will occur, and this country geographically is not immune, as we once thought we were. Um, the security of the homeland is so much at risk that we now have an entire government department that is devoted to that single subject of protecting the homeland. We also now have a central intelligence agency that is increasingly militarized. It is presided over by a general, David Petraeus, and it now has the primary military role of targeted killing of the leaders of Al Qaeda. Um, and apparently the CIA's drones are not reserved solely for the leaders of Al Qaeda. Uh, the New York Times just last week had a report indicating that there's a very active discussion within the Obama administration to be begin using drones on the rank and file of Al Qaeda at various theaters around the globe. It may be, and I'm prepared to accept that it is, necessary in this perilous time that there be somebody to do this kind of work, an awful task in the community. And it may also be necessary that this task go on beyond the prying eyes of the nation's press. But however one defines or discerns the nature of the military necessity, it is important to pause and reflect upon what may be called the secondary effects of permanent war. In doing so, we are reminded, I think, of the wise counsel of James Madison, the father of our Constitution. In 1795, Madison wrote, of all the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most be dreaded because it comprises and develops the germs of every other dread. No nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare." Unquote. Not least among the casualties of continual warfare is the rule of law itself. To begin capturing that consequence, to begin analyzing it, let me take you back three years to June the 12th in 2008. That was the morning on which the Supreme Court, as it always does in late June, came in to announce new decisions that it had reached. It was approaching the end of the term, and that's a time when judicial monuments of real importance are often announced. Justice Ginsburg announced the first opinion of the day, which was a minor little dispute, but it also had to do with having one's day in court. Before the end of the announcement of the opinions that day, the court had given a day in court to the detainees who were held at Guantanamo Bay. You may recall that Congress had decided uh, that uh, the detainees at Guantanamo Bay were not entitled to appear in the United States courts to challenge their captivity, their original detention, or their continued confinement. Um, but the Supreme Court had ruled to the contrary um, in 2006 in the Hamdan case um, that, um, that uh, the military commission aspect, at least, of Guantanamo uh, was invalid. It had been created by presidential executive order. But in 2008, the Supreme Court ruled for the first time in our history that the writ of habeas corpus extended to a territory over which the United States had absolute sovereignty and control, that is, the naval base at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. But there was another detainee decision that came down on that same day, June the 12th, three years ago. It involved two U.S. citizens who were being held by the U.S. military in Iraq. They had been accused by the Iraqi authorities of having committed crimes that were in violation of the laws of Iraq, and the U.S. government held them in custody. In this decision, the Supreme Court ruled against the detainees. 
even though these two detainees had, in fact, had their opportunity in a federal habeas corpus court to challenge their transfer to uh, Iraqi custody. The Supreme Court ruled that the courts had no authority to interfere with the uh, sovereign authority of the government of Iraq to try its own uh, criminal laws in its own courts and to be assisted in that by having the U.S. government, the U.S. military turn over uh, the two U.S. citizens. The uh, news reporters who were covering the courts that day um, probably, and then I think in, in reality, paid little or no attention to the second decision. Um, all of us were focused on the Boumedian versus Bush decision, which is the one opening the habeas courts to the Guantanamo detainees for the first time. Little did we know that three years later, the second decision of that day would have become vastly more important than Boumedian versus Bush. That second decision was called Munaf versus Guerin. Guerin was the Secretary of the Army at the time. <clears throat> Less than a year after Boumedian had been decided, the Munaf case had been declared to be the more important precedent on the habeas right. <clears throat> now, that was not what the Supreme Court had said uh, on June the 12th. The Supreme Court had treated the Munaf case as if it were peculiar to the factual situation in Iraq with the prosecution for violation of the domestic law of Iraq. In fact, <clears throat> and this is highly unusual on a major case uh, in the uh, Roberts Court, the Munaf decision was unanimous compared to the 5-4 in Boumediene, which tells you that it was probably a fairly easy decision for the court to reach, and therefore was probably not a case that the justices at the time thought to be of great consequence. <clears throat> even so, <clears throat> even so, it is clear by now, <clears throat> forgive me, <clears throat> Flying in airplanes often does this to my voice. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's very clear now that Munaf is the controlling precedent because the D.C. Circuit Court has become the controlling court on the law of detention. And I will go into that in some detail in a moment. There are many stories that I could tell you <clears throat> about this war, this war on terrorism. There are many questions to raise. One question which doesn't seem to be raised anymore is whether it's a war at all. We don't seem to be bothered by that. It's been clear, at least since the Hamdi decision in 2004, that the government of the United States could detain people. And it would seem to be clear in the Hamdi decision that people could be detained until the end of hostilities. However, <clears throat> you may recall, if you read the Hamdi decision, that the court said that this was not an open-ended detention authority. It said that the, if in time, the detention authority could begin to unravel, as of now, some of the detainees still at Guantanamo have been there for nine years. Among them <clears throat> are the Chinese Uyghurs. Three of them are still there because they have not found a place to be relocated, at least a place to relocate them that is not against their personal desire. We could talk about jihad and what grievances it has about this country, but that's not an area in which I have any competence. We could talk about how to wage the war on terrorism in military and diplomatic terms, but that too is beyond me. But I think it is important for me to talk to you about something on which I do feel quite confident to talk that is what happened, what has happened to the great 
great writ of habeas corpus. <clears throat> to put it very simply, writ of habeas corpus is now under very severe challenge as a war-weary political class goes on talking about who, among those held by the military, is to be freed, if ever, and who is to remain confined for what now appears to be, for many of them, the duration of their entire lives. That is so because it does appear, and with which I know of no one who could really disagree. This conflict does not have an end. We cannot anticipate a time, as we could traditionally, when there would come to be some kind of final resolution of armed hostilities, that war would at some time end. <clears throat> now, I want to stress up front that I am not in a position to evaluate the nature of the security threat, if any, that is posed by any of those held at Guantanamo Bay or any of those 700 or so who are now held at Bagram Air Force Base outside Kabul. That's partly because much of the intelligence upon which detention is based remains classified. And there is, in addition, this peculiar legal institution in the um, detention law field, the protective order. The District of Columbia District Courts in Washington, in fashioning the ways that they would deal with the Dumedian decision to try actual habeas cases, have constructed a regime in which there is information that cannot qualify for formal classification. <clears throat> because it does not meet the very strict requirements for that. But it is information that the Pentagon and the State Department deems to be improperly revealed to the public. So there is a whole range of intelligence, particularly interviews with other detainees, that remains not classified, but beyond the reach of the public. It is also beyond the reach of detainees themselves. Detainees counsel, by the way, all have to have very high security clearance in order to receive any information bearing upon their client's detention. But they cannot share with their clients this information that qualifies under the protective order. Even the recent leaks by Wiki of the documents from Guantanamo do not portray the full record of what it is that the government deems proper information upon which to base continued detention. It's important, I think, for any of us to ask the serious question of why, when the country has so much else to worry about, deficits, continuing two wars, political environment that seems to have lost all capacity to compromise, why should anybody be worried about 172 people at Guantanamo Bay and 700 people held at Bagram Air Base? Well, the, <clears throat> the reason I think we should ponder this is because we must ask ourselves, do we want to live or continue living in what is essentially a military hothouse. Listen to a comment that was made in April by Representative Tom Rooney, a Florida Republican who serves on the House Armed Services Committee. Our military, he said, not the Department of Justice, should be leading on the law of war Now it is clear to anyone who knows the history of the law of war that the military does play a very important role. But so does civilian law. The international rule of law is very much a part of 
conventional law of war. And yet, um, and this is something in, that we can discuss further, or at least in response to any questions you have. The District of Columbia Court of Appeals for the, D for the DC Circuit has ruled that international law has no role to play in informing the executive authority to detain anyone that is in this country. International law does not count in the mind of the D.C. Circuit's majority. The chairman of Congressman Rooney's committee and two Republican senators have sponsored several bills recently shifting the entire system of detention away from civilian control and it would lodge it entirely in the military. And the measures also, and this is important to my topic, would acknowledge a permanent war of armed conflict against a very ill-defined non-state enemy to be dealt with almost exclusively by the Pentagon. The main bill, which passed the House in May, would hand to the executive branch far more war-making authority than it achieved under the authorization for the use of military authority after the 9-11 attacks. You may recall that, a, that the AUMF, when one is talking to an audience that understands military matters, we're likely to get a lot of initials. AUMF extended the power of discretion to those entities related to the 9-11 attacks. There was a time, by the way, when John Yu, whose name you may know, argued that the 9-11 resolution did not extend beyond any entities other than those directly involved in the attacks on 9-11. He obviously changed his mind later. This new measure that has passed the House, but not yet by the Senate, would allow the president to use military force around the globe if necessary to capture what officials deem to be a suspected terrorist without first showing to any kind of reviewing authority that that person posed, in reality, a threat to the United States national security. Other bills that are now making their way through Congress, while not attempting to suspend the civil writ of habeas corpus, as Congress indeed tried to do earlier, would in fact make it so that there could be no genuine remedy upon a judge's decision that detention was no longer justified. Under these bills, no detainee could ever be transferred to the territory of the United States for any purpose, including prosecution of crimes, and no detainee could be sent to any other country in the world unless that other country were willing to make promises to the United States about what it would do with a released detainee. Promises that I can assure you no self-respecting sovereign nation would make to any other nation. The result at most would be what Meet Whitney called habeas light. That is precisely the intent. Of course, even if such legislation ultimately passes, the civilian courts will be open and they will be functioning. That is supposed to count for something. Remember the famous Supreme Court decision, ex parte Milligan, refusing to allow the writ to be suspended for a civilian who had been charged before a military commission. That opinion declared, quote, it is insisted that the safety of the country in time of war demands that this broad claim for martial law shall be sustained. If that were true, it could be said, well, that a country preserved at the sacrifice of all of the cardinal principles of liberty 
is not worth the cost of preservation. Happily, it is not so. Unquote. That was a Boumedian-like opinion in its own day, right after the Civil War. Unfortunately for Mary Surratt, that decision came too late to spare her from trial and conviction by a military court, a military commission, leading to her execution. And this is a story, by the way, that has recently been retold in a popular movie, The Conspirator. By the way, you may have noticed that the movie's release stirred up a really testy discussion, public discussion, over whether Robert Redford, the movie's director, was trying to manipulate history in order to condemn Guantanamo Bay. Move fast forward then from 1865 to, the, to now and today to examine another story about civilian and military justice and the politics that surrounds both right now. The law of war as it currently stands has been constructed perhaps largely out of the developing law of detention. The Supreme Court, for example, has issued four major rulings on war of terrorism issues, and each of those was about the question of detention. We now know that the government's power to detain, which in an unending war can be for the entire lifetime of a detainee, is being shaped under the influence of a toxic political mixture of fear, anxiety, and xenophobia. Added to that in diminishing the prospects for release from detention has been a remarkably concerted effort by the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia, and in particular by two senior judges on that court, Raymond Randolph and Lawrence Silverman, to bring about a judicial version of habeas light, strongly encouraged in that endeavor by both the Bush and Obama administrations Two very different governments in other respects, but almost as one in their approach to the law of detention. And further, what is now apparent after the preceding term of the Supreme Court is that there has been a distinct lingering effect of the retirement of Justice John Paul Stevens from the Supreme Court. One of those effects is there is a new hesitancy on this court review any detainee's case. The optimism that the defenders of the detainees and of the Great Writ had in 2008 has obviously waned and may have vanished. That optimism took a particular blow this past term when the Supreme Court turned down every one of the eight detainee cases that had been filed with it. Every one. And among those eight cases were challenges to the entire regime that has been laid out by the district courts in Washington to handle detainee habeas cases. Among other decisions by that court, I've mentioned one that came out of the D.C. Circuit. The international law has no bearing on the president's power to detain. Among others, you can detain if the government's evidence merely is more heavily weighted than the evidence that the detainee might offer, what the lawyers call the preponderance of the evidence standard, which is the least demanding evidentiary standard. Judge Randolph has, con has also constructed something called a, it's a mathematical probability index. It's called conditional probability. What you do, if you can understand it in a hierarchical way, you take one piece of evidence. Don't look at that evidence in isolation. You put it next to another piece of evidence. In time, you have built a hierarchy of conditional probabilities that at the end, the conclusion is that this detainee must be detained. Up the obvious effect of this additional probability theory, and it was the intent of Judge Randolph in articulating it to give added weight to the government's evidence in favor of detention. The Supreme Court 
could not hear that challenge either. Judge Randolph, by the way, um, went before the Heritage Foundation, made a speech titled The Guantanamo Mess, <clears throat> in which he compared the Supreme Court's decision in the Boumediene case to the characters in the novel The Great Gatsby. Those are people, he said, who make messes for other people to clean up. This a comment by a judge on an inferior court about the Supreme Court of the United States. Judge Randolph's speech to the Heritage Foundation, by the way, is not available on the Heritage Foundation site, but it has been recently republished in a book um, put out by Encounter Books, which is a compilation of essays about 9-11 um, and the anniversary. <clears throat> and so Judge Randolph's opinion is available there. Judge Silverman, on the other hand, <clears throat> has written an opinion <clears throat> in which he says that the government is wrong in supporting the idea that the government could detain someone based only on the preponderance of evidence. Judge Silverman says, you should be able to detain anyone about whom the government has some evidence of terrorist affiliation. Now, if you, again, if you read the Hamdi decision in 2004, the Supreme Court explicitly rejected the theory that detention could be based on a standard so tolerant as some evidence. However, Judge Silverman said, and I don't know of any basis for challenging the judge, but he said, I cannot imagine any of my colleagues voting to confirm the release of any detainee who poses any possibility, however remote, of further engaging terrorist activity. That is not just an assessment of the mood of his colleagues. There have been 38 orders issued by judges in Washington that the government had not justified the detention of those detainees. Every one of those orders has now been reversed by the D.C. Circuit. And, as I mentioned earlier, Supreme Court has chosen not to review any of the cases brought to them. Now, I must tell you that the, that the men and women, the volunteer lawyers who represent the detainees at Guantanamo and Bagram Air, Air Force Base, do not give up easily. There are probably about 60 of them. They're all doing it for free. One of them, a fellow by the name of David Reams, gave up a very lucrative antitrust practice in order to devote his entire life to defending detainees from Yemen. David um, is one of the people who were doing the really noble work of the Guantanamo Bay Bar Association, as it informally calls itself the group down there. That, by the way, is very much in the tradition of John Adams. You may remember that John Adams alone was willing to defend the British redcoats who were tried for the Boston Massacre. And there is, in fact, um, the John Adams project at the ACLU to encourage people to defend those who were enormously unpopular in the public. The Supreme Court has opted not just to stay out of all of the detainee cases. It has also chose to bypass any case that is seeking redress for torture at the hands of the U.S. military or the Central Intelligence Agency. It has insulated top government officials, including the Attorney General, from any lawsuit that would undertake to hold that person personally accountable for human rights violations. 
when the court in its most recent decision this term in the Al Kid case ruled that John Ashcroft could not be sued for using the material support law as a cover for detention. Justice Kennedy wrote a separate opinion, speaking only for himself, in which he articulated a theory that the members of the president's cabinet would be totally immune to lawsuits anywhere in the country for abuses of their power in office. That tells you where the mind of the president's Supreme Court is, because Justice Kennedy probably holds the most important single vote there. The court has also stood by silently as the executive branch with the approval of lower courts has turned the so-called state secret doctrine into a method to simply end lawsuits against government and government officials without a trial. State secret doctrine, as some of you no doubt know, originated in a decision in the Supreme Court in 1950, the Reynolds case. It originated as what is called an evidentiary rule. It gave the government the opportunity to identify each piece of evidence individually that could not be revealed because, publicly in trial because it would compromise or threaten to compromise national security. The Reynolds Doctrine, the state secret doctrine, has now metamorphosed. It is now routinely used by the government as a way to stop in its tracks any lawsuit, the trial of which poses any risk of discussing state secret. The most important case on this um, is a case in which uh, Binyam Mohammed tried to sue uh, small airline facilities company that worked for Boeing uh, in arranging the secret flights so that the CIA could carry out its program of rendition. Rendition is one of those wonderfully bureaucratic words that does not fully reveal what's going on. And the claim in the Mohammed case was that CIA was picking up terrorism suspects, secretly flying them to countries like Saudi Arabia, Libya, whereupon they were tortured in order to get information about terrorist activity. The Supreme Court has had three rendition cases offered to it, the most significant one other than the Mohammed was the Arar case. Mr. Arar is a Canadian, picked up in Europe, mistakenly, taken to Saudi Arabia, used seriously, and then turned loose on a country road in Albania. Made his way back to his home in Canada. He sued the United States government for what had happened to him. The lower courts have stopped all of these cases, and the Supreme Court has not chosen to review them. The Supreme Court also ruled in the Humanitarian Law Project last year that if a domestic organization has provided any support of any kind to an organization that is believed to have terrorist inclinations, or history can be prosecuted for providing material support to terrorism. This involved a group called the Humanitarian Law Project. One of the activities that the Supreme Court said constituted material support to a terrorist organization was advice that the project gave to an organization on how to put a plea to the United States. That's how far the doctrine of permanent war has gone. Outside the Supreme Court, 
the political climate has had other baleful consequences. Last April, Attorney General Eric Holder announced that the administration was giving up largely on civilian trials for those charged with the September 11th attacks, that is, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four others. It is a political truism, of course, that Democratic politicians, including this president, have an abiding fear that on national security issues they will be perceived as weak, soft on terrorism. The president has signed an executive order to institute what has all the appearance of a permanent military detention system, and it would operate, of course, at Guantanamo, and to operate that system on a schedule that will run well past Mr. Obama's time in office, no matter how many years he serves. The political sensitivity in the White House about its reaction to terrorism has been exhibited in a number of other ways, not least the abandonment of the whole idea that one day we would close Guantanamo Bay. Last spring, the Washington Post did an in-depth recounting of what had happened to the plan to close Gitmo. Perhaps the most telling quote in the entire very lengthy story was this from a senior government official said to have been involved in Guantanamo policy. At each turn, when faced with congressional opposition, the instinct was to back off. And the result was that what the White House, not what the White House hoped. We kept retreating, and the result was more pressure to retreat more, unquote. There is further evidence of that kind of response. The president, after once signing into law a Pentagon money bill that cut off any funding for transferring detainees to the U.S., even for prosecution, he vowed at the time to resist any renewal of those restraints, but in October, he signed another bill doing the same thing. And as I indicated earlier, more restraints, more limiting restraints are apparently under review in Congress. Attorney General Holder, of course, has almost gotten the message. He insists that the Congress has tied his hands. And so, except for the Guyanli case, which is now in the civilian courts in New York, there's not been another case that Holder has been willing to risk bringing in the civilian courts for prosecution of war and terrorism crimes. Despite the demonstrated success of the civilian courts, and there is a record, a long record, of successful prosecution in terrorism cases, the dominant political preference now, despite the recent repeated exhibition of the clumsiness of the Guantanamo military commission system, a system which for all the world looks like a system of sham justice, it is now clear that we have shifted the entire project of detention and prosecution largely away from the civilian superintendents of military management. It's clear then, despite all of Congress's efforts to push the administration further than it wants to go in the war on terrorism policy, that the executive branch itself has grown enormously in power. There can be no better example than the choice of Guantanamo itself. When John Yu and others decided in the weeks after 9-11 that there had to be a place where the military could keep terrorism suspects beyond the reach of all civilian courts, they thought Guantanamo was the perfect place. They were relying very heavily upon a 1950 Supreme Court decision, Johnson versus Eisentrager, which had said that the federal courts in this country had no authority to hear the challenges of German prisoners of war when the military was holding at a prison in Germany. The Eisentrager case, of course, now has lost its relevance because of Boumediene. But now, a full decade after 
wide discretion exists within the executive branch to actually detain, determine the fate of more than 800 individuals, Guantanamo and Bagram Air Base. And while the politics of the war on terrorism supports that discretion, as long as it's lodged in the military, executive power has also found particular favor in the judiciary, again, I mentioned the D.C. Circuit. Among other decisions, that court has ruled that the writ of habeas corpus has no application whatsoever to the detainees at Bagram Air Base. The fate of those at Bagram is still under some review in the court because their lawyers do not give up. But the prospects of non-military review Tension in Afghanistan seems remote at best, at the very best. So let me just say in summation, and I do invite your comments and questions. As is so often in our prior history, our Constitution has gone to war, and the rule of law has suffered as a consequence. That, to me, is one tragic legacy. Thank you. I assume that no one in the place disagrees with any of that. But I do invite comments, criticism. Yes, thank you. First. I was just wondering if, given the narrowness of the specific uh, cases regarding the thing whether you believe the same type of state of uh, terrorism will potentially extend to domestic uh, individuals. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking specifically about uh, what has been happening in places like the Mall of America in Minnesota, where people are being detained because they're leaving cell phones behind, and the records are being passed on to the FBI, mm -hmm. for example. Well, the, the Obama administration, like the Bush administration before it, does take the view that the theater of war is global, including the territory within the United States. Um, they made that, the Bush administration made that argument most heavily in the, in the case involving Jose Padilla, who, of course, was not arrested in Afghanistan or or any theater of war. He was arrested at Chicago airport in, 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 in Illinois. Um, there is, I think, a likelihood that detention will extend to the domestic fear, sphere. Um, the Supreme Court does seem to have some greater sensitivity about citizens than it does about aliens. Um, and so, of course, Guantanamo, Guantanamo is about aliens, because there are no citizens being held in, on the, in the Cuban prisons. But I sense that um, the aspiration is um, that uh, the same law of detention would apply uh, inside the U.S. if a terror suspect was found. And by the way, the use of the material support law, and those of you who don't know your legal history, the material support law is a very old law designed to assure that a witness shows up for a prosecution. They just they just don't just lost. So you can detain a person who is an essential witness in a criminal case, but you can only detain them until the trial is held and they are either called or not called. Um, in the case that went to the Supreme Court last year and the Attorney General won, Al Kidd was detained for 15 days on the premise that he was, his testimony was needed for a terrorism trial in Portland, but he was never called as a witness. So uh, uh, his detention, it's now clear, was merely designed uh, uh, to, uh, to get him off the streets because the material support law was obviously used, and John Ashcroft said this publicly, there's no secret about this that the law, the, the law of material support should be used as a way to round up people 
suspected of terrorist activity. So I, I think the home front is not immune to extension um, of the doctrine of detention. Yes, sir. The uh, Iraq resolution, 23 whereases, uh, passed by in uh, 2002 and then acted on with House document uh, 50, 108 uh, 50, with uh, diplomatic efforts, which were pretty weak if you read it. Uh, they seem to be. It uh, seems to me the flaw, uh, the thing that concerns me is that here we have a war or conflict, if you want to, you know, the American Legion term conflict, but we've got a war with, weak, with very weak causes, and it is never, in terms of the reputation of the U.S. as a serious and sovereign people, has never really gone, revisited that to clear up that weakness. Uh, I think, in some sense, it's it's the emperor without clothes because the weak causes are in the face of, of like the international community that here we are a superpower kind of doing what we want because uh, Saddam was such a bad guy. A lot, I'm saying as reasonable care for our own reputation, don't we have a responsibility to hold our Congress, uh, their feet to the fire, and say, hey, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really quite serious. This is really old history for most people. It's like, you know, what is what does the Iraq resolution have to do with anything that's well, like... You know, you know, it's interesting that you should raise that. In none of the litigation that we have seen in the in trying to get the courts to articulate the, the, the nature of the law of war when in a, in a period of, of global terrorism threat, the Iraq resolution is never cited as authority for anything. Just, the, the government just simply ignores it in any kind of litigation. Of course, most of the litigation now is arising um, uh, about Afghanistan rather than Iraq as the, as the full outcomes. But you must understand that, at least presently in Congress, and this has been true since 9-11, um, there is a very strong appetite for really muscular executive power. Um, and while there was some complaint this year about President Obama and the use of um, military intelligence and logistics to support the Libyan campaign, the air campaign against uh, Gaddafi. Um, that was, I think, not representative of what the instinct is, particularly in the House of Representatives. Um, the House of Representatives is, is very determined that the war on terrorism be waged much more aggressively than they believe the Obama administration is prepared to wage it. So they want definitely uh, to pass new authority, and they expect this new authority to be used. Um, whether or not um, uh, and they can get a sufficient number of votes to, to get this through the Senate, I don't know. But um, for all the world knows, the concept of a congressional declaration of war is a dead letter in the Constitution. In the, we have had so many armed hostilities that have gone on, and we've had only five officially declared wars as such. And when, while we rhetorically refer to the global terrorist threat as a war on terrorism, it appears that we have no way to declare that war. Because in conventional um, legal terms, War can only be declared against another state. And the reality is that terrorism is stateless, at least, at least since the demise of the Taliban government. Al-Qaeda is not affiliated with any government. It may have influence in many governments, but it is not a government. And therefore, it would be impossible for us, if one were even inclined to do so, to have a formal declaration of war. So the international reputation of the United States was said to be a factor in the 
President Obama's desire to close Guantanamo. Um, but I don't think there is one person left in the Obama administration who entertains any belief that Guantanamo will ever close. You know, the, there's a lawyer in Boston, a wonderful fellow by the name of Sabin Willett, who has represented the Chinese Uyghurs in Guantanamo. Originally, there were 22 of them. They're, they're down to, I think, five left at Guantanamo, five or three. Sabin will tell you that if they ever turn out the lights at Guantanamo, it will be a Uyghur who does it, a Chinese Muslim. There is absolutely no evidence whatever, and Judge Reggie Walton found this, no evidence whatever that any one of the 22 Chinese Muslims had ever engaged in anything like hostilities toward the United States or any kind of activity that even suggested sympathy with a terrorist idea. They were picked up in Afghanistan where they had fled from the western region China because of the rampant persecution of Muslims in that area. Five of them were sent to Albania, four of them were sent to Bermuda, two of them were sent to the island, to an island Pacific nation, and five remain because the government has not found a place to take them. And it is very clear when you're talking about international reputation. No other country with which the State Department is now negotiating is willing to take any more detainees until the United States demonstrates that it is willing to have detainees in the United States' own territory. And as long as the tendency is in Congress to keep these shores completely non-inhabited by any detainee, even in a federal prison in Illinois, then this reputational problem is going to persist. But I don't know, I don't know how much international reputation bears upon the thinking in Congress. I suspect not very much at all. One more question, okay? Yes, please. Given the uh, peculiar, peculiar choices and balance between individual liberty, uh, national security that the federal government has been making recently, what would you like to see the judiciary do, or the Supreme Court specific, uh, do on these issues? From here on. Well, <clears throat> on the law of detention, it does seem to me that it's terribly important that the last word on this must come from the Supreme Court. Um, if that word is that the present law of detention satisfies the Boumediene decision, then I think we must live with that. It is all equally important, I think, that the court find a way to restrain the use of the state secrets doctrine. Um, it is a cruel challenge, an extremely difficult one, to balance the need for secrecy and the need for transparency in an open society. Um, and if the state secrets doctrine now eliminates virtually entirely the prospect for transparency in policies like rendition, policies like uh, torture, um, it's very difficult to know whether there are any constitutional limits. Um, the Supreme Court enjoys perhaps now almost peculiarly, a very strong level of support from the American people. Um, the people trust their Supreme Court, I think, and they trust the legitimacy, legitimacy of what it does. But when, when the court takes a pass, um, whether or not it does so out of some institutional cowardice, or perhaps, and this may be the case with this court, it is incapable of assembling a five justice majority to decide these issues, then the country is the loser because we have this fantastic 
judicial resource that is not being used. Um, one, one of the reasons why the court may have turned down all of the detainee cases last term is that Justice Kagan was disqualified in six of them. Um, and in the dynamics of the Supreme Court, if, you, if one justice doesn't take part, it still takes four votes to grant review of any case. But if the other eight justices are divided four to four, then why would four vote to grant any case when they know they can't pick a fifth vote to prevail on the merits? So we're going to have new cases. By the way, there are two cases already filed at the Supreme Court by detainees counsel. Again, both of them are trying to get the court to establish one fact and one fact alone that you cannot be detained unless you personally engage in armed hostilities against the United States or its allies. That's what they would like the court to establish as the law of war. But in one of these cases, the government of the United States is so assured, so confident that the Supreme Court will not grant the case, they didn't even respond. And the court, which has it in its authority to ask for a response, did not do so. And usually what happens when there's a case and there's no response, the court routinely denies it. That will happen in one of these cases. If the government now is going to adopt this practice of simply foregoing any response in any of these cases, every one of them that comes along will be denied. We have on the way to the court now the first military commission prosecution. Interestingly, it's the same fellow, Salim Ahmed Hamdan, whose case led to the 2006 decision striking down the Presidential War Commission system. Hamdan was convicted at Guantanamo. The Court of Military Commission Review, in his case, upheld his conviction. He, his lawyers have now filed at the D.C. Circuit where it must go first, and then it will be up to the Supreme Court. We will see whether the Supreme Court, at any point, wants to examine the military commission system. It is a question of balancing transparency and security. Um, and I would never want you to leave this room believing that I think that's an easy equation to work out. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.